Great. Th thanks, Liz. Uh, another perspective, perhaps, if he's ready, I I'd like to ask Philip Ross to uh, say a little bit about the high street and more broadly, the, the questions that face you in a police and crime commissioner uh, election, where obviously um, shop workers face real challenges, especially right now. Uh, and what are the police going to do about that? Um, so how does that business, uh, pro-business message resonate in, in your campaign, uh, Philip? It'd be interesting to hear that perspective. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Hamish. Yeah, on, I mean, we've talked about on our campaign when we did our original pages, we talked about being safe at online, safe at home and safe on the streets. And then I said, well, this really extends to business as well, actually. So, you know, but instead of being safe at home, safe at work, actually, when people are actually at work. But the issues that people are worried about when you go around and... When we talk about actually where the message is getting through, the need for labour representation is even so strong now when you hear about all the problems with county line drugs and you hear stuff, problems with antisocial behaviour, how sort of the fraying on the edges of our society that you actually you're actually picking up is actually re is, is really strong. And those issues of antisocial behaviour are actually really strong, particularly for retailers, actually, because people are worried about going to the shops, actually, people, and then the, the antisocial behaviour then extends into the into the shops themselves, that actually, the businesses are actually get you know, shop workers are getting threatened, getting a hard, getting a hard time, so it's a re it's really quite, um, it's quite, it, it's very serious, and we've also got this other one, the third one, which I talked about, about, about being safe online, and up until now, the response about being safe online, it's a bit like, um, the response is a bit like, you know, it's about like the weather, you know, so with stormy weather, there's nothing we can do about it because it can come outside. But 34% of all crime is actually fraud and cybercrime, actually. So how this can be like the weather, and it's got nothing to do with, with business, is something that I, I, a lot of businesses find di difficult to actually grasp because this is actually a, a major threat to them, actually, how they're actually being, how they're, how they're being defrauded. For, for us on the crime side, on the police side, we're picking up, coming from the Labour business background, I, I felt straight away, actually, why aren't businesses actually involved with yeah. local crime plans and things? Yeah. Like that? So we're making pledges, actually, we need to actually, businesses actually, small businesses, big voices, and actually how we put together those crime plans. Because if you've got small businesses, if they're retailing, particularly they are at the heart of our communities, actually, you know, and, and actually creating safety around those businesses is actually a sort of way you can sort of push out and create safety in, 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 a, in, a, whole, in a whole community. So we've, so we've felt that that's actually been very strong. And there's other, there's other little rules and laws that you can actually put in place for like excluding people from shops. I've been talking to the Association of Convenience Stores and they've, they've come up with some, 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 re some, re some really strong, strong policies. But the whole... The big issue we've got there is that generally going around is really, I think it was Bill said before about the hostility sort of faded away, yeah, from people, but you're finding a lot of despair and disillusionment actually with people is what I'm finding, but we haven't quite converted that them to, for them to come over to us actually, and that's 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 that crucial point that I'm actually seeing when I go and knock on the door, knock on the doors, and we found on because as you know I'm self-employed and we had there was a survey that really spoke to me, which was done by Forgotten UK about the exclusions on furlough and everything. And they did original, they did a survey and they said, how many people voted Conservative last time and Labour? It's 54% voted Tory last time, 22% Labour. And they said, what's people voting now? Only 8% are voting Tory, but it's still 22% Labour. And the others are the 42% that's left in, it's been left in that, um, I don't know what they're going to do. And so we've, there's big opportunities for this to convert this despair and disillusionment, but, and that's the next step we've actually got to um, go through. Mm. Thank you. Thanks very much, Philip. Um, anyone else wants to come in on the high street issues? I'm going to go uh, back to Lucy shortly about some of the macroeconomic stuff, but anyone else on the high street? Any, any points to be made or questions to be asked on the, the high street, a small business, self-employment? No. OK, well, let me ask you, Lucy, um, the, the bigger question about, you know, whether Labour can be trusted on the economy. I guess it doesn't resonate so much in these elections, but nonetheless, the, the fact that we are constantly painted as an anti-business party has a lot to do with fiscal and economic credibility. That's going to be crucial uh, at the next uh, general election. Do you think that the, the way that this government has spent money like there was no tomorrow has, has shifted the, the arguments on that? Or are we still seen as a spendthrift? Uh, party that will, will spend taxpayers' money without uh, without heed. What, what's your what's your take on that, Lucy? 
Well, I think undoubtedly, unfortunately, we probably still are seen um, as a sort of fairly uh, spendthrift, uh, uh, you know, struggle with economic, that fiscal like economic credibility um, issue. And I think that's quite sort of deep and profound in the kind of DNA of, 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 of public opinion about us and our, and our brand, I guess. I mean, the, the question for me is how do we address that? What is What are some of the ways that we should look to address that? And I think what I, and maybe this comes more from some of my experience in the 2010, 2015 um, parliament, when I was working very closely with Ed and um, on the, the, the general election then that we, that we lost at that point, probably because of some of the same issues, you know, we were that 2010, 2015 parliament was defined by uh, the conservative Lib Dem coalition government, which did a very, very effective job of blaming the global economic crisis on the Labour Party and that they were the party to sort of fix the, the broken roof, so to speak, and that we, and the, the sort of so-called mm. note that was left and all of that sort of stuff, you know, played very heavily into that. And that, that formed quite a strong, it was a very, very strong narrative of that parliament, um, which there is a, a sort of a, a, a considerable sort of residual hangover to and, but as you rightly say, I think there is a different context now, which is that you've got governments around the world, including our own conservative government, uh, spending a great deal of, of money um, that they're borrowing in order to spend to support the economy. And you look at what Biden's doing in America with a huge sort of stimulus package and so on. There is a sort of obviously a much stronger kind of establishment view uh, from the IMF. Uh, the Bank of England, the OECD and others, that you can't cut your way out of these economic crises. So that sort of narrative from that 2010, 2015 mm. parliament, I think has been exposed. Now, whether that has got to the man and woman on the street or the man and woman in Liz Hines pub garden, which is the only place they can be at the moment, she hasn't really got one, um, in the few benches she's got outside, maybe, you know, whether it's got to that level of, of, of understanding, I, I don't think so. So the question is sort of, what do you do about it? And I think I would worry about us as a party coming to the view that how we deal with that is, if you like, not saying anything about anything for fear that it looks like a spending commitment. I think we've got to make a bigger argument and it goes back to what I was saying at the start of this meeting. We've got to make a bigger argument about why investing and intervening and working with business today to meet the challenges of the future is in our economic interest to do that and will in the end uh, give us a more, um, you know, a more healthy uh, balance uh, and, and a more healthy economy and more healthy people and more secure people and workers and, and so on. And we've got to make some of those bigger arguments and I think worry less about, oh, but if we say that, it just looks like we want to spend money on something again. Because the truth is to, to meet these ambitious green targets that we've now um, rightly got in this country is gonna take a massive transition of our economy. That's not gonna happen by the market just doing it itself. It's going to happen because the state plays an incredibly active part in that. And the fruits of that could be could be really profound in, in better jobs, long, you know, higher skilled, more decent green jobs uh, uh, of the future. You know, how, as, as Thangham was saying, um, you know, a really big agenda on, on um, retrofitting homes and building new um, zero carbon homes and so on. You know, these are ambitious agendas that do require us to be a bit braver about the fact that, that that you have to invest to do that and I think if we if, if we allow ourselves I think to just be slightly caught in the headlights to say well we can't say anything about anything because no one believes us and we've not got any economic credibility um, I, I just sort of think we'll kind of end up where we ended up in 2015 and every other mm. election which is sort of losing. Thanks very much, Lucy. That was a very cogent. Uh, Sorry, well, no, it's not question. what everybody thinks, but it's what I think. Well, I, I have to say, I completely agree. We can't bury our head in the sand. And I think Biden is leading the way. I mean, you know, it's an incredible package of support for American business that 
you know, is now uh, accepted as the, as the right way forward by most people. I anyway, think, well, I think well, Pangham wants to join in that. Battle. Yeah, no, I've got three, I've got three uh, hands up, so I'll take those. Then I'll go back to Thangham and also to Bill if they want to. And then I'll ask uh, Lucy to, to, to wrap up. We've got about, uh, got about 10 minutes left. So next was Del Goddard, then Liz Mins, then Alec Lieber. Del, please. Yeah, a couple of points. Uh, good morning. Um, one of the, I, I'm Kent based actually, and London based, but Kent based as some of you know. Um, the point I want to make is that we still keep using the term red wall around the shop. Um, and people down in around East Kent and North Kent have said, why are we going on about what we should do for the Red Wall when actually we lost an awful lot of our industrial capacity a long time ago and we lost a lot of Labour seats. There's only Rosie in, in Canterbury. There's no real Labour presence in most of Kent. And people are saying, what are you going to actually do for our coastal communities? Just take Ramsgate, it lost its, it lost its airport, it lost its ferry and it lost its hoverport. And people's view is that Labour doesn't seem to be speaking for other areas uh, as forcefully as it's talking about what it lost in 2019, forgetting that it lost, although Lucy referred to that, what it lost before. And it seems to me that we've got to get the messaging right in order to be able to be uh, concerned about those communities whether they're called the left behind, but we need to find some positive language which actually makes it work. Uh, the other point I want to make, which is our 10 centres fallen apart, and uh, there aren't any obvious ones, and the amount of money that's around at the moment is not going to repair the damage uh, that we find as well. But I think we need to be also, and I just put it on the table, don't expect a, an answer, and I, I'm going to pick up the Brexit issue. There are a lot of businesses that actually are not in retail hospitality, but are actually trading or were trading with Europe. And they are suffering and they don't perceive that Labour is doing anything to help them either. So you've got the high profile COVID related uh, sectors that are really uh, struggling. But what about the other sectors who write to me or talk to me and say, what are you doing for me? Because at the moment I'm stuffed. Uh, and it seems to me that there are some broad messaging issues that Labour has got to get to grips with. Thank you, Dale. I expect Lucy want to come back to that point towards the end, but let's move on to Liz Minns. Liz. Yeah, hi. Hi, Lucy. Great to have you with us. Um, just, just, uh, sorry, earpiece popped out there. Just a really quick one from me, just sort of linking up what you were saying um, about the creation of jobs. I've been doing some canvassing recently with, I'm in Surrey, in Epsom and Newell, and there's a chance we can double our number of Labour county council seats from one to two. We've got a great candidate marked <laughs> uh, So we're out on the doorstep at the moment. And what I'm finding is cutting through actually is, you know, that, that not, not regularly, but it's really interesting to hear it is, you know, that, that Keir's lovely phrase, the best country to grow up in, the best country to go old in. And the other idea that we're talking about children and teenagers and young adults not having to move away to find jobs and people are asking me about that a little bit, showing a bit of interest, saying, well, okay, what does that mean? What, what's Labour going to do about that? Um, and obviously, you know, we can't just suddenly click our fingers and have, you know, wonderful, high paid, high qualified jobs in, a, in every, you know, part of the country. But when we talk about the green agenda, and, and as we know, if we really commit to that, we, we will have jobs right across the country in many different um, sectors that we, we need to spend big money on. And, completely with you, Lucy, we shouldn't be embarrassed to talk about that, especially when we can look to Biden and say, look what he's doing, the massive stimulus he's put in place. So I, I, I would like us, I would like the Labour Party to talk more about that sort of linking up. So businesses on the doorstep, is that about those 100,000 that Keir mentioned in the, the recent speech? I think it was, it was either the CBI speech or the new chapter in British history, you know, that we really want to encourage those new businesses. And they would be right across the country in those areas where we have, and it's not just about winning elections and we can't put it in those terms. We know in many ways it is in this conversation here, but really it's about, again, you know, what Dell's just said about, it's not just the red wall, it's every sector, every community that needs that real um, injection of, of cash that's going to produce good jobs on the doorstep connected to the green 
agenda. And it, it's really beginning to sort of link up in people's minds, I think. And it, it's really exciting to see that. And where, where I canvass, it's the poorest wards in, in, you know, in, in, in our constituency. So it, I'm not talking to wealthy Surreyites here. I'm talking to people who are relatively, you know, down, down, down on their uppers often and really wondering where to put their vote next. And I just wanted to say, it's great to hear you talk like that. And can we begin to join those dots somehow? Because I think people are really beginning to listen and it's great to hear. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Alec Lever, you'd signaled. Go ahead. Good afternoon, all. Uh, Lucy, the uh, Labour's bad with money narrative is it needs uh, countering by the by the facts. Since 1965 to 2015, we were in power for 24 years. The Tories were in power for 27. In that time, Labour grew the economy 10% faster than the Tories did. And growth is the way out of our problems. Uh, growth in a consumer economy is fueled by wages. And uh, the trick was that uh, the labour share of GDP in that period was uh, about three and a half percent more than in the Tory period. And that is what fuels growth. And that is what Labour's about, the clues in the name. The, uh, the problem now is that the economy, which is driven by business, 1% uh, of companies, sorry, Bill, about this, uh, delivers 56% of sales and employs 46% of voters. Uh, big business, where labor in our DNA is butting up against the bosses, the bosses are not in control anymore. Shadow banks are in control. And the US Business Roundtable agenda, as you were alluding to, on stakeholder capitalism is a silent call for uh, government to get Paul Singer off their backs, Elliott Management and all the other hedge funds who are holding CEOs in golden handcuffs to do their business. And that is a depression of wages in relation to dividends. Um, Alec, I'm going to I'm going to stop you there because we're bumping up against the clock. Yeah, but thank sorry, you for that, that contribution. Really appreciate so basically, it. we need to get on side with the CEOs to get the shadow banks off their back controlling uh, Annual general meetings. Thank you, Alec. I'm going to call uh, Thangham and then Bill if they'd both like to speak, uh, and then Lucy to uh, wrap up for us. Th Thangham, can I just, for the avoidance of doubt and for the record, <laughs> clarify that you're not a candidate, you are the Member of Parliament for Bristol West. And I'm, I'm sorry if I misspoke on it's that. It's okay, don't worry, don't So, worry. so uh, thang Thangham, you're very welcome to-, yeah, uh, to I'm, make I'm, a I'm the men, men for Bristol West and the Shadow Secretary of State for Housing and Homelessness. <laughs> but just want to amplify what, what others have said and particularly give support to Bill and Lucy um, mm. talking about how we need to make the case for various things as part of Labour's offer. Um, I've just done a quick Google. When If you put in Boris Johnson's spending, he only boasts about military spending. And he does use the word spending. He never boasts about spending on hospitals or spending on some of the things we'd spend on. And I wonder whether some of the issue here about whether or not we talk about how we talk about our economic offer is that we choose our words wisely. So we invest in our children's future. We invest in the homes that are fit for the future. We secure jobs. So some of that framing that I think here has been helping us, um, you know, showing a lead on, I think is really helpful here. And that then we don't need to necessarily get as tied up as Lucy has said on sort of getting hung up about whether or not we've made a spending commitment. I think let's just think about whether or not we're showing the country how we want to invest in them. And I think that just comes 
comes across in a slightly different way because what we can't do is pretend that voters don't think that about us ignoring that will get us into pickles we've been in before but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking about what we're going to spend money on but i think we should use the word investment and commitment and level you know the boris johnson didn't just come up with leveling up for no reason um i don't think we should adopt that language but i think there is something in thinking about how we say the things that we say and thank you for letting me be part of this sorry i've been wandering around i have been listening <laughs> okay. i've been packing at the same time we, we we have somebody you should talk to called Eleni Chalmers, who's on our EC, who who's a, a guru of communication strategy and messaging, and she's making exactly those same points. And, and we'd really love to help the party come up with some better words, some better language. It's not all about language, but that's a large part of it. So I really welcome what you uh, just said, Bang. I'm, I'm going to put you in touch with Eleni. I think we can have a, a useful conversation. So um, over, over to Bill now. Uh, would you like to come in, Bill? Yeah, look, to agree with Thang, um, uh, investment-led approach, absolutely right. Uh, look, Alec, as you, as you named me there, and uh, you're right, um, we have a very unbalanced economy in this country, and I think we do need to take, take on with full engagement a reform of our financial system so that we move away from short-termism and quarterly reporting and for our large companies they can take long-term decisions and invest properly back to that word again um and there is a real appetite for it lucy said this earlier about you know, about senior executives mark carney's been making these points too i think we are absolutely in the right place here yeah. we need to be the party of businesses of all sizes not just of the small ones just for the avoidance of doubt on my part but we need to have a more balanced economy like they do in Germany, where you have far more uh, medium-sized businesses and smaller micros too. Um, and to Lucy's, I want to really back up Lucy here. We've got to be bold. We've got to look at what Biden is doing and say we can do it here. We've got to say, look, the evidence suggests that the green agenda can deliver, but you've got to really get into it wholeheartedly. Um, you know, Ed, Ed was res responding to yesterday's half-hearted at measures by the government by saying we've got to go far, far further. That is absolutely right. What we must do is shout this from the rooftops. People have got to see that, see that we are very clearly making a completely different offer to the, the, the Conservatives and that this will be a, a, a complete change of, of, of direction. Credible, yeah, absolutely. But it has to be clear and it has to be bold. Otherwise, you know, that is not going to give people a reason to move away from the, 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 the Tories, especially when they're making all these promises, false though, they, false, false though they are. And I think the evidence is already there, Hamish. My local authority, the Liverpool City region, it's happening in London. Lucy will talk about what Andy's doing in, in Greater Manchester um, and in the, uh, in, in, in the boroughs in Manchester. And it's happening in small boroughs around the country like Stevenage too that, 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 that I've come across. Local authorities working with businesses, promoting businesses, and we can shout about those, those, those schemes, about how we're supporting, about how we're investing in our business communities, where Labour has power, and above all in Wales, where you've got a national business bank that is delivering, and you know that, Amish, because you're, you, you're in Wales. Labour in local government, that's one, one of the reasons these elections are so important. We do well in these elections. We get into government in a local or, a, or a, uh, a regional or a national level, as in Wales. We demonstrate that we can deliver, and that is a big part of getting the credibility to get back into government. So get out there and campaign, uh, and, and let's take this on. And just one one other thought, Dale, you mentioned Brexit. Um, we've got a we, we we we've got to. Obviously, we we're not going to refight Brexit, but we have got to come up with solutions. And this is what my conversation with Make UK was all about this morning, dealing with the, the problems with paperwork and tariffs and the ability for people to work in, in the EU 27 or EU workers to come and come and work here. Uh, we've got to take this on as a positive looking forward way, repair and be the party that repairs that reputational damage to trade uh, and, and come up with solutions. And I think if we are coming up with the answers, if we are coming up with them in a positive and bold way and we, we and we are confident in what we are saying that offers that alternative to people that gives them the faith to support us thank you very much bill um i'll turn finally to uh lucy i think you can tell from this really wide-ranging conversation that you've you've stimulated and inspired uh, a lot of enthusiasm and uh, we're really really grateful to you for for doing that 
We'll go on shortly to the phone bank when we'll uh, try and deliver some more votes. But could I give you uh, the last word to wrap up this part of the event? Oh, thanks so much, Hamish. Yeah, I, I always like to go sort of big picture um, rather than just be sort of in the in the in the weeds of things sometimes. But yeah, I appreciate. I'm the I'm the appetizer to the main course, which is. Uh, a gale delivered dialogue session um, and, di and dialogue is great it's so it, it once you've done it once it's a really good user user facing sort of system and gets us to the right um, uh, voters so that's really important so thank you all very much for doing that I'm not going to say very much because that eats into that valuable time of, of making the, the, the calls I just maybe to wrap up I think some of the point, the final points that were made there and, and the overall thing, which you know, is Alex's point about growth, which I think kind of fits what Dell and, and Liz were, were saying as well. Having an ambitious agenda for, for growth, you know, is absolutely sort of critical to our economic credibility and message, to our pro-business or whatever term we're going to come up with um, message. And the government have got a deeply unambitious agenda for growth. I mean, the forecast in their recent budget were pitiful, quite honestly. And I think, you know, this investment programme, as, as, um, as Sangman very rightly said, not a spending programme, but an investment programme into growth is, is key. But I think what we have to also unashamedly start to shape out um, about what's different about that is it's not just the kind of growth that we've had over the last sort of 30 years and then the Labour Party's there to sort of better share the proceeds of growth and the so-called sort of trickle down. It's a this sort of inclusive growth agenda so that we we are we are meeting the needs of our workers, our uh, populations, our communities in the type of growth at the beginning, in the type of growth that we're that we're creating. So we're not just reliant on that sort of trickle down um, approach. I still I seem to have said something funny to Bill there, he's laughing. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> laughing at that one quite a bit um so you know that and that agenda i think you know is as relevant to north kent and ramsgate as it is to you know greater manchester or the liverpool city region or what you might call the the red wall and, and i think a message and a narrative around that that isn't leveling up that isn't the red wall that isn't inclusive growth that nobody understands is something we've got to we've got to try and address but but that's the that's the actual agenda anyway um, so over to the main course, Hamish. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, Lucy. You're, you're underselling yourself. You, you, you were the star of the show and you've inspired us to hit the phones now. And we're really, really grateful to you. And we'll be talking again soon and campaigning with you right up until May the 6th. So good luck to you and all your uh, colleagues in, in Manchester and beyond. Thanks, Lucy. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me again. And good luck with the phones. I, I...